let's talk a bit, uh, move sideways a bit, but let's go to some of the first packed conferences you went to. Because there you are, a South African <laughs> from England who started yeah, yeah. a theater in Montreal. You love the idea of my transformations, my I transmutations. Know, I, know. I, I, think I like that circle, and I like mm. the turf. Mm. But meeting artistic directors from across the country, so meeting your new, uh, yeah. your new club, so to speak. Yep. We went through some traumatic times. Yeah, I remember the first time in one of the early conferences in Ottawa when we challenged John Roberts, John Roberts was the Minister, Minister of, 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 of Culture, to, to, we were demanded his resignation if he didn't do this, this, and George Luscombe and I were, were in the forefront. Do you remember who, you and George Luscombe and who else was there, do you remember? Well, uh, uh, I think that, that whole early crowd, Paul Thompson and, uh, and Glasgow and, uh, you know, all those. Shaw, Stratford. Mm, what was his Shaw name? Shaw Gascon. Michael no, they weren't part of PACT ever. Uh, Gascon, I don't think he ever attended a PACT conference. Um, it was the new wave in Toronto and some from the East and the West. They could afford to reach, to come to the conference in those days. But John told John Roberts, I met him later on in Quebec City, had an evening of drinking with him and he said, you know, you guys un undermine my, my, my professional career by doing that to me by demanding my resignation. You reduced my credibility in government. And he said, you want to know something? I was the one who in cabinet, in Trudeau's cabinet, fought for the cultural constituency. And I was derided for that because they couldn't see any votes in the cultural constituency. And don't think that Trudeau's cabinet was a cultured, culturally minded uh, and committed cabinet. It was not. And John Roberts was fighting a losing cause, and our little call for his resignation, ironically, didn't help him at all. And I felt very sorry for him. <laughs> and I thought we maybe lost a friend there unwittingly. Mm -hmm. And what did you make of your uh, other English Canadian theatre compatriots? Because you moved New York. Some Canada. good, some bad, some good. We had a, I had a good relationship with Bill Glasgow for a long time. The early David French, David uh, Freeman plays, we brought over to Montreal. It didn't always, the reciprocation was not always as generous, I felt, as it had been when we'd taken the place. When we tried sending a plays to Tarragon, they got a cooler reception than that. And uh, in fact, Bill undermined uh, one, of the, one of the Tremblay plays that I did. I didn't like his translations, and Burek's and his translations of Trombley. I thought they lost the music, uh, the, the, the lyricism in the original, rather prosaic. So I asked uh, Trombley and I asked his agent, Goodwin at the time, if I could find a new translator. And they said, yeah, sure, you go your way. Bill doesn't have a monopoly of this. So I phoned Bill and I told him that I'm finding a new translator. I hope you don't mind. There was a pause. And he said, well, thank you for telling me. And then days gone by and I started getting a company. I found a new translator, Sheila Fishman, I think I was talking to. And I was in Toronto speaking to Erjo Correda and he said, I hear you've lost your translator. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh yeah, yeah, Bill spoke to, who was Sheila Fishman, was it? No, she's no longer with you. So I phoned Sheila Fishman and she told me that Bill had got on the phone hysterically to her and said, you will never work in my theater again if you translate. I could have killed him then. If I'd, got, if, they'd, if I'd walked through a wall, I could have, would have murdered him. So I had to pay him a royalty for, because I was committed to the play and I'd already cast Joan Orenstein and other people and I needed to have a translation. I needed to pay royalties and, and I, I couldn't use anybody else. I didn't, we were already in starting rehearsal. So I did what I, I, I paid as a bloody royalty and I found a, a poet in, in Montreal and we slowly retranslated that play without Bill's permission. And, uh, and Tremblay came and saw the play and he didn't mind the translation at all. But it did not enhance our relationship. So those are the things that happened. And but George Luscombe. Ah, he was a giant, I think. I never have anything but praise for George. 
a marvelous man who be, uh, who who was not didn't fully realize I think his dreams in the Canadian theater but who showed us so many valuable things so many stories that we could do and such uh, originality and presentation and so on he brought he brought Joan Littlewood's tradition uh, that I had so much liked in England he brought it into the Canadian theater but in a living way I he admire the price by being the first one to start, so to speak. He started in the 50s. Yeah, I guess, I guess. He paid a price because he was the first man out. So I guess so. But uh, a real hero, a real hero. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. him, he was in the hospital with his heart and his yeah, leg, and his and legs. And in the hospital, and he was roiling and raging and good old yeah. And he said, I want to play King Lear. He said, and I want to play it on the rooftops of Toronto. Robert, I want you to make this production happen. And he I'll did not go gentle into that good night, our George. Absolutely. Martin Kinch, Tom Henry, the Toronto Free Theatre. Yeah, I, I have a great relationship with both of them. I, I never greatly appealed, their sadomasochistic approach to leather and, and whips never greatly appealed to me. Uh, they turned almost every spectacle into some aspect of sadomasochism, I felt. But, hey, it was, it was fun and they were great kids and, uh, and I liked them both. I still like them both. Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. John Hirsch? John Hirsch and I were great friends. We used to sit there and swap East European jokes to each other. I, 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 I was very fond of him. I, he told marvelous productions. He never always staged marvelous productions, but he told marvelous productions. Because uh, there you are in Montreal, relating mm. to we're talking about the theater. Now he's a great guy. He, of course, he he. You know, everybody knows this. It's probably part of common that he gave us the idea of regional theater in this country. He initiated that in Winnipeg, which has been such a marvelous melting pot of of of, of, of ethnicities, especially the Jewish, and the Slovakian and Ukrainian and sort of thing, East European. And he brought that alive, and then, of course, he worked at Stratford. Yeah. So where do your Slavic roots come to the surface, right? Your father was Lithuanian, or Slavic, in a way. Well, Russia occupied that part of Lithuania. My father had been a soldier in the Russian army in the First World War, and imprisoned and gone through all that hell. So where was your father born? Lithuania. Well, it was just part of Russia at that time. Right. And uh, he joined the Russian army. I think he was obliged to. Uh, the third son had to go into the army. Uh, and he might have volunteered. He was very left in those days, and the revolution and the meant a great deal to him that time. He was bitterly disillusioned during the purges of the thirties. So when you say he was left, does that mean he was a socialist or a communist? He was a Bundist, which was the Jewish uh, leftist movement that was uh, somewhat apart from the Communist Party, but in, in, in the main subscribed to the same ideas, the Bundists. It was a substantial movement in Eastern Europe at the time. They got into conflict with the Communist Party as the Stalin era proceeded, but uh, they were quite influential and important in their time. And my father was not a Zionist. His brother, however, went to Palestine at that time and settled and became a farmer and was a socialist to the end of his years and, and uh, worked in a in, in, in a, not a kibbutz, uh, in the modification of kibbutz. Commune? What type of commune, yeah, where you live privately but you share your marketing, etc. Uh, but so my did father... did you inherit your politics from your father? Yep, and from my sister and... politics is... Uh, uh, Politics and theatre have been mixed for you very important. together the whole time. My sister has been a very big influence in my life. She, at an early age, was a trade union leader in Durban at the age of 18. And uh, she married an Indian trade union leader, which was in South Africa was unheard of. And they went to live in Cape Town and were banned under the Suppression of Communism Act. They had to go to England. They, they stowed away. They were sent to Hungary to run British English radio and Budapest, and they came back disillusioned to England, but the British Communist Party was very Stalinist and was not interested in their revisionist ideas, so they were banished to the perimeter and had to start their lives afresh. 
He died, her husband, she is now got remarried and came back to South Africa in 92. But she's always been a big influence in my life, uh, my sister Pauline. And do you think when you mix politics and theater together, it's for theater's good or theater's detriment? No, there are very few people who can do that well. Bertolt Brecht is one of the few. But uh, very few people do that. A lot of people do that badly, try and mix the two. How do you mix it well? You forget about the politics and you do the play that you want to do. You tell the story you want to do. Brecht could remember his politics and combine them, but not many people can. Even, even, even Fenario falls foul from time to time when he gets too politically minded. When he gets back to his Irish roots of just telling a great story, he encapsulates the politics within the story. You don't have to beat the audience over the head with your politics. So you forget the politics. If you are who you are, you will tell a story which will reveal your politic. If it does not, then that's your problem. And so, do you think that an artist, uh, a theater artist or any artist, has to have a political instinct? That's very funny. When I was invited to come to the National Theater School, this is I had 1966. I had to go to London to be interviewed by James de B. Domville. Bill Davis offered me the job, but Jim Domville was the administrator, and he happened to be in London, and he wanted to see this guy, Morris Podbury, who'd been invited to come and teach on the English side. So I traveled down and arrived at the house late at night in Chelsea, and the door was opened by this guy who looked like some wizened Chinese diplomat. It was Jim Domville late at night. He said, we better sleep, eh? We'll talk in the morning. So we slept in the morning. He said, actually, I'm off to the plane, but maybe we can get some breakfast and talk, eh? So we went to a hotel and got some breakfast, and he's eating his eggs, and he's looking at me, and he's thinking, tell me, he said to me, what do you think of the political, of political theater? I said, well, in a way, all, he said, well, that's, that's fine, that, that, that's fine. See you in two weeks in Canada, eh? <laughs> That's as far as he let me answer this question. He wanted, so I said, in a way, all. No, I said, even non. So what I mean is that all theatre reveals a certain politic. Even theatres that are defiantly non-political will demonstrate a political situation, obviously. Yeah, it's non-commitment, non-involvement, disengagement, you know, uh, escapism. It'll reveal your politic one way or another. So every work of art reveals a certain politic, but you don't, uh, you don't, you don't lead with your political fist. <laughs> you don't do that, obviously. Because there are some artistic directors or artistic producers who say politics has no place in the theater. Well, a type of politic has no place in the theater, but they're wrong. By saying that, they're telling us a great deal about their politic. And they're influencing people yeah. uh, in that moment as well. They may not think they are, but they certainly are. So if you were Moral. an artistic director of a theater and someone came to you with a political play, which was a great story, but you hated the politics, would you do it? Uh, but if I hated the politics, I probably wouldn't do it, no. Because then, then I, I wouldn't be able to carry it through to fruition. You know, here I am as an artistic director. I choose a play that appeals to me deeply, personally, that's a fact which should always prevail in every theatre, every artistic director. Every play they choose should appeal to them personally in their heart of hearts. Even plays that have just entertainment value should really speak to them. There are good comedies and bad comedies. But you have got to carry that passion through a whole collective endeavour. 30, 40, 50, 60 people will be laying their clammy hands on that property before it sees the light of day. And if the passion with which you receive that play is going to be realized on opening night, you'd better have a strong passion about that play. So if you are half-hearted about it, if you think it's a good story, but I hate its politics, it probably won't reach the stage in a commendable way, in a fashion that would recommend it highly to the audience. It'll probably diminish the play in the course of its treatment, because you won't be there to keep it alive in all its aspects. You won't be protecting it, pushing it forward. 
exciting everybody else, drawing them into the endeavor and so on. So I, w I would probably not choose a play that offended me.